Hi, guys, and welcome to the second episode of the Carla Garrick Show. I'm so excited uh, to have you guys back with me today, uh, and welcome to the Voice of Independence. For those of you who are following along, you know we did the inaugural episode last week, and you can find that on my YouTube channel, Carla Garrick TV. Uh, one of the things we talked about is how on the show we're going to be doing iterations of things and then I'm going to have guests and as you know, we're just kind of trying things out. So for today, uh, in terms of the iterations or the changes we made, uh, I uh, found a guest who will remain secret until a few minutes from now. Um, I have a video that I want to show you, and then uh, we're going to dive straight into the conversation with my guest. So to set up what this, this video is just supposed to be funny. I find it hilarious. I hope you're going to find it hilarious too. It's a little tongue in cheek, but basically for folks back home who have been following my my journey, you know that I am, uh, I like to joke about things, kind of anti-establishment, and I'm against mandates for things. And the reason I've been an outspoken critic of the vaccine mandate is because I don't think we should be forcing people to make decisions about their bodily autonomy that they're not happy with. And I think that if we sort of open up this door uh, towards these kinds of things and say that this is okay, it's just going to be a massive, destructive, slippery slope. So uh, this video is a funny way of saying exactly that. So here we go. Excuse me. I'm gonna need to see your proof of vaccination. Oh. You now we got the new mandate going on. Right, sorry. I have the, um, the app. Oh, Moderna, huh? Heard that one knocks you on your ass. I got the Pfizer. Oh, you're a Pfizer guy. I, I hear Moderna's better, but not gonna judge, you know? <laughs> <laughs> the new normal. Have a good one. Have a good one. A vaccine passport? Yeah, but I need proof of at least 10 booster shots. All right, 10, 11. Where's the... Okay, AIDS vaccine passport. I'm gonna use an allergy test. <laughs> Lyme disease, chicken pox, H1N1, rabies tag, H1N2. All right, proof of the herpes vaccine. And what about the herpes booster? I literally got it like 10 minutes ago. Let's see it. All right, hand, foot, and mouth disease, H1N5, prostate exam, whooping cough. I'm gonna need your Netflix password, HPV. I actually have HPV. I need proof to show solidarity to the HPV community. I'm gonna need to see your blockbuster card. Tetanus. Negative test for the Black Plague. Tetanus booster? I don't have it. I'll give it to you now. Proof of political party. Proof of diversity. Are you serious? We already have two white guys in there, okay? That's our limit. Okay, uh, I'm Jewish. What do you think this is, 2021? You're gonna have to be way more oppressed than that to get in here. You got like a 23andMe test results? Yes, yes. 50% Ashkenazi Jew. 0.000027 Native American. Why didn't you just tell me that? You got an anti-racist card? All right, now I just got to check your white guilt score. 9.7, wow, not bad, man. Just got to scan you for male toxicity. Okay, quick set of questions. Would you have sex with a trans woman? Yes. Can men have babies? Yes. Do all lives matter? Yeah, no. Quote from Brown City to prove you can hang with gay people. Um, yes, queen. I'm sorry? Yes. Yeah, that's better. How many statues have you toppled this month? Oh. Nine. You support the police? No. Are all Trump supporters racist? Yes. How many abortions have you paid for? Five. I'm gonna need to see your punch card. All right, four more and your tenth one's free. How many people have you canceled this month? 18, 19, including my grandmother. Racist? No, she still likes Louis C.K. Ooh, even worse. Ever been me too? No. Me three? No. Me four? No. Me seven? Um, me 69? Mm -hmm. I need proof of a black friend. Okay, how many pronouns are there? 92,627. All right, and finally, I need you to recite the full sexuality acronym. Uh, L-G-B-T-Q-I-A-O-N-M-P-Z backslash question mark, greater than sign, less than sign, squiggly mark, a peace sign, at sign, hammer and sickle, poop emoji, and symbol for titanium. All right, 
put your mask on and show them your receipt. You know, I actually lost the receipt, so... How are we supposed to give you your laundry if you don't have the receipt? Get... Excuse me. Oh, gonna need to see your... All right, so uh, hopefully folks back home could hear that and that they found it amusing too. I think that humor is just a really, really, really great way to try and deal with difficult issues. So I hope that amused you. So next coming up on today's The Carla Garrick Show is my favorite human in the whole wide world, my darling husband, Louis Collitz. So hey guys. welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So we're going to see how this goes because uh, Louis and I don't often actually speak to each other in English. I mean, we do often speak to each other, but we speak to each other in Afrikaans. Um, so I'm going to actually let you uh, tell folks a little bit about your background. Um, and, you know, so why are you awesome, Louis? <laughs> um, I'll first I'll start with where... I, came, I come from, right? So I grew up in South Africa, like Carla did. Um, I went to an Afrikaans school. Uh, she went to an English school, English speaking school. Um, it was apartheid at that time. Basically, apartheid ended after I left college. So basically, all through my school years um, was uh, apartheid South Africa. So black people lived in one town, white people lived in another town. Um, as far as that goes, you know, it was a kind of a regular experience, but it's kind of weird for Americans to think about that. So it's, it's hard to explain. But um, um, I went to uh, college in um, Pretoria, South Africa, uh, uh, qualified as an electrical engineer. I met Carla uh, during that time. Were you an electrical engineer or electronic engineer? Electronic. Electronic. So the same thing. He yeah. says it's the same <laughs> thing, but whenever I say electrical, he corrects me. So I'm just going to help out here like a good wife would. <laughs> Um, I met uh, Carla at, at college as well, um, and uh, I pretty soon get in, got into, uh, it was right at the time that um, uh, computers, uh, the PC came out, um, I was a, an avid um, computer nerd, um, so I switched from electronic engineering, I, I pretty soon get, got into um, computers instead, software, software engineering. So is it true, not to interrupt you, that you were one of the first people in South Africa to own a computer and that it was a, was it an Apple II that was hooked up to the television? Well, actually, so what happened was I had a good friend that had an Apple I actually, or his Ooh. dad had an Apple I, but my dad actually ran his business on uh, Apple IIs um, and like even way past when the uh, PCs uh, came on the market, he was still using his Apple IIs. Uh, pretty ingenious system. It was based on VisiCalc for those that still know who that, what that is. It was the first <laughs> spreadsheet. It was revolutionary. It, it, it changed the world. Um, so clearly in our relationship, Louis is the spreadsheet guy and I'm the uh, <laughs> wear your fancy pink clothes girl. <laughs> yeah. So um, got into computers, got into bulletin boards. Before This was before the internet. Um, I was fortunate enough to, uh, just after college, work for a company that had, uh, it was an academic institution that had access to the early internet. Um, so I was basically one of the first people in the world. Um, well, I mean, it's, it's a fairly big set of people, but um, uh, so I, I had access to the internet as people at universities, um, uh, engineering uh, departments had at that time. So that was pretty fortunate. So I got into that uh, fairly fast. Linux way back in 91, I think, or 93. I, I, I don't remember anymore. Um, <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> long That's time why ago. we got gray hair now. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so then Carla, uh, we, we started dating and we were basically living together. Um, don't tell my grandma. <laughs> yeah. Um, and her parents were traveling in the States and they heard about the green card lottery and they called us and they were like, hey, we heard about this thing. Uh, can we um, uh, write you in? And we were like, yeah, whatever. Um, we didn't even know, even know what it is um, or was. And um, then like a year later, we got this notice in the mail that said that Carla won the green card lottery to go to America. Uh, so we hadn't planned that, that at all. We were like, what, what are we gonna do? Um, but after, you know, it was such an opportunity that we, uh, we decided to go. Uh, we had to get married first because we were just living together. Uh, no, we weren't. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then when we got to America, um, we first came just as on, on, on um, uh, for, you know, as tourists and traveled around and see, you know, what's America about? Where, where should 
where, where do we want to live? Because it's fairly big and fairly culturally diverse. Um, and um, we fell in, well, we, we went to um, San Francisco on the perfect uh, mm -hmm. August day, which is, as people that live there know, not at all what San Francisco weather is like. That's <laughs> um, true. And it was just amazing. We were like, oh, oh, we want to live here uh, for sure. Uh, so we just, based on that, I mean, it was two or three days, I think, that we were there on that experience. Uh, we fell in love with the city and we're like, we're moving here. So um, that's where we ended up. Can oh, I? So another consideration was Carla was Carla had a uh, uh, a law degree, which depending on where you, which state you are in America, that might you know present hurdles to continue that career. So I might have had to go back to uh, law school as opposed to just being able to take the bar exam, depending on what state you're in. I'm going to interrupt you because it just reminded me with with my pink jacket when you told that story. So this jacket for folks back home, unbelievably, although you can tell it's maybe a little tight, uh, is a vintage jacket from Pretoria, South Africa, uh, which I bought in probably 93 or 94. And uh, one of the things that Louis and I have done together, uh, mostly be at his behest or at his uh, but through his example is, you know, we switched our lifestyles to sort of more keto and, and for people who follow along, you know, I lost a lot of weight. And so one of our frustrations was always we've moved a lot over the years and uh, I have always moved with this jacket, which did not fit me for a really long time. So I actually wore this in San Francisco right when we moved. I don't oh, yeah. know if you remember that, but no, I uh, <laughs> but I do. So this this little pink jacket has come a long way with Louie and I. Um, all right, so then we're in San Francisco. Who did you work for out there? So, um, so happily, uh, San Francisco is just a, uh, a short distance away from Silicon Valley. Um, so unbeknownst to us uh, at that time, uh, so we discovered that and it was like, it was, uh, uh, I was just in the right place at the right time with the right qualifications, uh, got a job immediately. Uh, this is uh, my first uh, a uh, few years was in the semiconductor equipment manufacturing industry. Um, so we built equipment for companies like Intel, Applied Materials, um, like big se semiconductor manufacturing firms. In fact, Louis had to, uh, the one time our parents, my parents came to visit us, he somehow had to come to Vermont. This was when we were still in California for six weeks. Uh, to uh, to work in some fab, right? With yeah, was like it wafers Intel, and Intel fab and um, what was it, was it Intel? IBM, actually, IBM um, Fab in um, near Burlington. Um, and it was actually, there was a, uh, we don't know anything about snow in South Africa, so I kind of panicked. And I got the <laughs> most expensive down parka I could <laughs> at Land's End or something, way too big, and, and but it was cozy. Oh my goodness, we still have that coat. I wear it yeah. sometimes to Bikram because it's just big and gross and kind of like a sleeping bag and yeah. almost 30 I mean, you could survive years old now. It. I think insane. they actually made it so that people could wear it on Mount Washington because Mount Washington oh, in New Hampshire yeah. is like the coldest place on earth. And I think that was why you picked it at yeah. the end. And you know, there, there was actually a blizzard while I was here so that, uh, or in Vermont. So that was kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, so I semiconductor so manufacturing industry and then the dot com bubble hit um, and uh, with uh, I got involved with the startup with a couple of friends um, we drove towards our second round funding we got seven million in the first round the second round would have been our our um, uh, marketing funds uh, but right before we started going out for that the bubble burst so nobody was giving money to anyone um, and then we ended up folding the company unfortunately it was a great idea unfortunately it didn't work out timing wasn't right so so uh for the young ones out there so in t uh, this so this was like 96 when we came out and then we were working in silicon valley through 2000 2001 and basically silicon valley at the time was you know in this boom because of money creation because yeah. uh you know that's important part of the thing that we really uh focus on 
is the economic series of Austrian economics, which basically looks at, hey, where does money come from? And what happens if we have this massive amount of debt? Can America, as we all know, that's in the news this week, you know, are we going to have $30 trillion in debt? Does that seem like a good idea? And of course, we're of the mind that, hey, no, that's probably not a great idea. Why are we of this mind? Because we went through a boom and a bust twice now, right? We went through it in two 2000 and then again in 2008 when the housing crisis started so 2000 so louis was on the i think it was like business week uh, startups or something like their company was on the front page of the 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 magazine like you know they'd gotten all this funding we were like woo, we're gonna make it the best american immigrant story ever and then ram, all right. So then. <laughs> so yeah. So I mean, it was it was an amazing time. Like you know, but there was money flying around, funding the the silliest ideas. Um, and you know, there were great parties and all that. It was, it was, it was a fun time. I, I'm not. I'm not. I mean, it, but it was all fueled by by money creation, uh, money printing. So was it around that time that you heard about the Free State Project? No, no, that was, that was later. I think so. What happened next is we we took some time off because both of us were working like insane hours. Uh, so we took some time off to travel um, in, in East Asia, um, a significant chunk of time, actually. Um, and during that time, um, I didn't have any time to read at all. Um, and I, I, I was like, I need to read some stuff and I need to read some nonfiction. And, and um, I need to just know, learn about something else than computers and software. Um, so I, I, for some reason, I got uh, I came across a reading list by um, Virginia Postrel. OK, yeah. And she had books on there like you know, from from uh, Mises. Um, uh, what's the other Western guy? Rothbard. Uh, Rothbard, like and, and lots of other books as well as well about the market and about history and, and about fashion. Very about fashion. important. Uh, it, it, it was a very wide uh, reading list, and I, we start started reading some of those um, as we traveled, uh, and that's when I sort of the penny dropped about what happened in, um, and we had a lot of conversations about that as well, trying to figure out, you know, how did we, what, what happened, <laughs> you know? Um, because it's a very strange experience when you go from, so you don't know, right? Like you're just fresh off the boat, you land in this place, you've heard stories about America, and then you come and you're like, wow, this is even like a hundred times better than we expected. Like, you know, you have a great job, you're making good money, uh, you're going out a lot, you, you know, life's good at the companies themselves, which were all, you know, sort of in this money creation mode, you know, you, it was massages at your desk and... Yes. Uh, you know, Sometimes. like I, I mean, it was it was a good time, and we didn't know better, so we just thought, oh, this is how it is in America, and America is awesome, and of course, America is awesome, but we had no idea, so it was quite a shock to us when 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 things went south. So when you were going through this reading list, right? So now we're somewhere in Southeast Asia or India. You're reading this list. Um, is that when you heard about the Free State Project? No, actually no. Uh, but that's where I connected with the um, with the uh, the Austrian economics. So uh, okay. Hayek von Mises, which is really influential in, in in all of that. So actually, maybe we could bring up that quote quick. Um, so we have a quote here, and um, one of the things I'm going to be doing on the show is to ask our guests to tell us, you know, what's their favorite quote. So Louis gave me this quote. So uh, do you want to read it and then tell us a little bit about what the significance is to you? Yeah. So I, I came across this quote. Um, as uh, it was actually the von Mises family seal um, has this on on the on the, uh, 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 on the on the seal, and it says, uh, "Do not give in to evil, but proceed ever more boldly against it." Um, so it's Latin. It actually comes from Virgil. So he, he uh, took it from Virgil, and it's just in terms of Austrian economics and and sort of the peaceful, cooperative world that it imagines. Um, uh, it made a lot of sense, right? Don't give in to evil. We have to. We have to fight evil, and evil could be anything. It could be uh, our own, the evil that lives in ourselves, like the fears, the the bad behaviors, um, all that. That's that. It could be that, or it could be the evils in the outside world: socialism and um, um, uh, violence and control, uh, all of those things. So that resonated really well with me. So I, it's and it. It kind of instinctually, I also res resonate with it um, based on my experience in South Africa. I mean, I've seen a lot of weird stuff. I mean, it's <laughs> not like like super bad, but like how a, a, a whole society could could 
uh, sort of just pretend that there's not bad being done in their name, you know, just sort of conveniently ignore that that there um, there are these oppressed people that are not being treated fairly, you know, or the same as they they are. Um, so that just that quote just resonated with me naturally. All right, so then let's say it's like 2003-ish. Now we've heard about the Free State Project. <laughs> okay. You really want to talk but, about that, right? <laughs> well, no, I just want to I want to get us to what what it is that you're doing in New Hampshire oh, okay. and why you why you know why we're here. So we so we moved out in 2008, right? Yeah. And um, you've been involved in various activisms, and and I really want people back home to start to understand, you know, we're really committed to this state because we're choosing it as our home, right? Like, we chose New Hampshire as our forever home, and and we really want to preserve and expand the liberties we find here. You know, there's no other place in the world that's like, live free or die, and death is not the worst of evils, right? That's probably my favorite quote. Um, so let's talk about a little bit of the activism you've been involved in over the years, besides, of course, being a like really profound supporter of all, <laughs> all your wife's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you've served on several nonprofit boards. Yeah. So for me, the, if the Free State Project is all about action, right? And the first action you take is committing to moving and then actually moving. And once you're here, um, you know, it, it entails doing. So for me, it, it was serving on the boards of the FSB in the, uh, just, I guess, before. Uh, I was before me, so in the yeah, early so, days, like yeah, 2005 so just moved, to I guess. eight, maybe, yeah. yeah. Um, served on the FSB board, um, helped them out with technology, um, helped Carla when she was serving as president um, with uh, technology and marketing platforms. Bailed me out of jail. <laughs> Bailed her out of jail. <laughs> um, I also served on the board of the NHLA, uh, which is a local organization. And uh, that stands for? The New Hampshire Liberty Alliance. What they do is they, they read uh, state house bills and rate them on a liberty scale. So, you know, uh, from A to uh, F, I guess. Well, actually, A to CT, and the CT is a constitutional oh, yeah. threat, and that is what Lou D'Alessandro in District 20 of the Senate districts is. Yeah. Bad, bad, bad. Um, so those are the major high points. Um, so I've, I've been involved with. Um, Actually, don't uh, you right serve now, on We yeah. Are West now? Yeah, right now. So so I think my my activism has shifted from you know at a statewide level um, to a more even more local level. Um, so I'm I'm working with an organization called We Are West, which is just in West West Manchester, New Hampshire, uh, and we we do things like litter pickups. Um, uh, we have we now have an annual. Uh, uh, Louis has probably day. S- you've probably like single handedly picked up a ton of trash in New Hampshire, like a literal ton of trash in yeah. New Hampshire, uh, mostly on the west side, but also in Goffstown. So uh, whenever we go out and we walk the dog, or whenever Louis goes out on his own, he's always out there with his little picker, and he will just walk the trails and pick them up. So well, you know, drop him a thank you for that. <laughs> well, that's kind of like. I think that's kind of my philosophy is like, you know, and it's, there's actually a movie uh, with Denzel Washington in it uh, where uh, there's a scene in the movie where he starts removing um, graffiti from uh, uh, an apartment's wall. Um, that's not his. It's just it, the apartment was, was graffitied. And the, the, the one kid asked him, why are you doing this? And he's like, if not me, who will? You know, and it's, that's kind of like the, the ethos of the FSP and, and fighting for liberty and fighting against statism is... Um, if we don't do it, who will? And and really, that's that's at its heart sort of what individualism is, right? So uh, von Mises, who you quoted earlier, talks about human action, right? That's his big tome. And by big, I mean the books like this thick and it's dense. And so every time guy. I've tried to read it, <laughs> I fall asleep and it lands on my head and wakes me up. So, you know. But, but, but the idea is human action, right? So it's this notion that we don't just uh, say it's someone else's problem or someone else is gonna solve something, but it is what are you personally doing about X, Y, and Z that you feel strongly about? Um, and so I think that really is sort of a, a ethos that, that we share, right? And I'm not sure if folks can see this picture behind us here, but, um, uh, it, it, I posted this on f- Sunday, and uh, it says, people who mend fences together, mend fences together. <laughs> and while it's sort of a joke, I think that that is an important thing that that people need to understand is that you have to live your life as an example and as a, as, 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 yeah, like, you know, you want to live a life that you're proud of. And so 
uh, I think for both of us as well, was sort of this idea of becoming healthy, leading by example, sort of really trying to be aspirational in terms of what we're doing. Um, and again, that just starts with every small little step from removing the graffiti to picking up someone else's trash. Now, ideally, y'all stop dropping your trash around and, you know, just actually take care of you and yours and all of that. But that is another uh, issue. So what do you love most about New Hampshire? Wow. Um, there's a lot of things that I like. Um, I mean, the the um, so we come from South Africa again, uh, which is fairly like where we grew up. Uh, did have summers and winters, but it wasn't a very uh, dramatic. Mar- dramatic shift. Uh, so I, I love the seasons. It's, it's awesome to have summer and uh, fall and spring and everything in between because there's actually more than four seasons. Um, <laughs> What's the other one, Louis? <laughs> oh, I don't know. There's like, uh, some people have Mud. up to 12 or something. Mud. I've yeah. heard berry season. There's like little winter and big winter. <laughs> and it's, it's complicated. Um, and then um, I love the people. I mean, uh, so the uh, New Hampshire people are, um, are super friendly. Um, they're super mind your own business kind of people. Um, and um, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of the people live in small towns. The small towns are, are, are wonderful. Like uh, they're all quaint. They're all great places and f- full with great people. So I, I, I do enjoy that too. And f- and the, the the best reason is that the Free State Project um, uh, chose New Hampshire. Um, and and one of the big reasons is that there are uh, a lot of libertarian folks that wouldn't call themselves libertarian, but essentially are um, in their sort of mindset libertarians. So. That is a great that is a great advantage of New Hampshire. All right. Well, thank you. I can't believe we're out of time pretty much in one minute. So um, we're going to wrap up here, but I'll certainly have you back at some stage and maybe we can delve into some of these issues a little more. But thank you so much for joining me. For folks back home, if you're looking for more information about um, about us or about the story or about the Free State Project or anything like that, um, I was interviewed in several podcasts last week. I did the Brian Nichols Show episode 349, Why New Hampshire? Hampshire is becoming a sanctuary for liberty. Uh, There was also a small podcast I did with someone. uh, It's called The Honest Offense, episode 75, From the Apartheid State to the Free State. And then also Lily Tang Williams, who is a dynamite lady. She was born in communist China and immigrated to America. She and I share and Louis share our immigration stories. And so she uh, interviewed me. It's a 30 minute clip that should be coming out in the next couple of days. So that's kind of where we are with the Carla Garrick show. Thank you, Louis, to joining for joining me today. Okay. Um, we are going to continue to work on this. Maybe I'll get an intro and an outro. Next week, we're going to have someone help with the video quality and we will just keep Uh, working and plugging away and working to make New Hampshire the live free and thrive state. Thanks for joining us, guys. Peace out.